Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There's two things I want to look at today as we're we're going through uh, Genesis 4 through 6. Uh, I'm going to be reading a portion, uh, the first part of chapter 4 and the first part of chapter 6. And there are two patterns that I think would be helpful for us to look at. Uh, here, here's an example of how the Bible is both history, these are actual real people we're talking about, as in at least the way I'm reading it, uh, you read according to genre. Uh, so some, if the genre is fiction or if the genre is a uh, fairy tale, you read that differently than if you're reading history. Uh, and this sure gives all the indicators to me of history, uh, you know, especially starting in chapter, well, uh, yeah, it's all history. Uh, Okay, so, uh, but before I get there to the reading, uh, there's a couple things I'd like to point out, uh, especially about numbers. Uh, you've heard of symbolic numbers. So, you know, for example, if you're reading chapter five and you're reading the genealogy, I, I made it very helpful for you by putting the names in bold. So you can just kind of look at the names in bold and skip over the other stuff because it's boring. Do I get criticized, points down? I get marked down by God if I say some of his word is boring. Uh, the genealogies are though actually very fascinating. If you count from Adam and you count all the way down, uh, you're gonna run from Adam all the way down to, if this number seven, this is Enoch right here, this, this, this number right here, this thing, seven. And then Noah is number 10, so you count and all those, Adam, no, uh, Lo <laughs> Enoch, and then number 10. Why did I do that? Anyway, Adam is number one, Enoch is number seven, and then at the very end is Noah, number 10. Okay, you notice those numbers? Seven, 10, you've heard those numbers before? Yes, you have, because those are highly symbolic numbers. Uh, and, and I believe the genealogies have been crafted that way. It's not uncommon for genealogies to skip generations uh, for the purpose of making a point. That's not bad history. It is good genealogy, which I suppose is its, is its own genre. Right, so where have we seen those numbers before? Well, you've seen the number seven already. There are seven days of creation. And by seven days, these are days, you know, evening and morning. Uh, these are 24 hour days. I'm not going to get into physics with time is speeding up. Not going to do it. Not going to go there. I'll just say these are 24 hour days and there are seven of them. What's going on there is typically stuff we're not asking. And that's what I would encourage us to do is ask the question that's being answered, not the question that, for example, science would be posing to us because they ask too often the wrong questions. You're gonna see the number seven again in verse one. Uh, and I tried to do this in my translation uh, that there's seven words, Hebrew words, in verse one. There are 14 words in verse two, seven times two. There are 10 times where God says, where Genesis one says, and God said, 10 times. 10 times it says, and it was good. And I was wondering if there's a similar thing with the words named and separated. Okay. I don't know. I really ought to pay attention to that. Okay, but you see that those numbers seven and 10. We saw Enoch, he's number seven. Noah, he's number 10 in the genealogy. So you pay attention to that and it's like, oh, wow, these guys actually know what they're doing. They're good writers. If you look in chapter four with Cain's genealogy, I don't know if you're supposed to count Cain as one or as two. Because if you think, oh, Enoch, he gets this extra little snippet and Noah gets this extra little snippet at seven and 10. Well, if you count seven from Adam down to Lamech, Lamech at number seven from Adam, he gets a special little section about him too, this incredibly boastful boast, uh, you know, kind of like his grandfather Cain, father Cain, yeah. 
But if you count from Cain down to Lamech, it's six. And so you can go, oh, he's seventh from Adam, like Enoch, or he's sixth from Cain, like Cain, as in six is the number of a human being. How do we get that? Six is the day humans were created. Uh, you know, six is the number of the beast. Six, yeah, you, you got that? It's the number of, the, uh, of humans, four humans, symbolically speaking. So you pay attention to those numbers. You're going to see key numbers like, you know, the Bible really likes twos and threes. Occasionally they mention four. Occasionally they mention seven and ten, twelve, four times ten, or ten times ten times ten. Yeah, it'll have those kind of symbolic numbers out there, you know. Okay, you with me? Yeah. So let's take a look at the two patterns I was going to, I was promised you we were going to look at. So one is the pattern of rebellion against God, the pattern of sin. All right, so the, this is, again, chapter three is historical, and uh, it, it actually happened. So uh, before we read chapter four, and before we read chapter six, I want to read to you the pattern of rebellion against God. Three, verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that it was desired to make one wise, or probably better translated, prudent. She took, and she ate, and she gave some to her husband. Don't stick to me on those counting six things there. But I just want you to keep that pattern in mind. And then, so she rebels against God, she sins. God brings his judgment, and then God brings his grace. So those are the two patterns I want us to look for, especially as we read chapter four. All right, this is chapter four, beginning with verse one. Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of Yahweh. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to Yahweh an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their portions. And Yahweh had regard for Abel and his offerings, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Yahweh said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to, his, to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then Yahweh said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And Yahweh said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to Yahweh, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me from today away from the ground and from the face I from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then Yahweh said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And Yahweh put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. And then jump to chapter six with me, and I'm going to read the first uh, just seven, eight verses, I think. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then Yahweh said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. 
The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and after, also afterwards, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man and they, were, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And Yahweh regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So Yahweh said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. This is the word of the Lord. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would open up your Holy Spirit so that we may understand the purpose of your word, uh, believe your holy word, and live holy lives according to it. Amen. So let's start with the pattern of rebellion, and then go to the pattern of sin, judgment, grace, sin, judgment, grace, sin, judgment, grace. You're going to see this. So uh, I mentioned the pattern before. Eve saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise. And she took of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So let's take a look at this pattern uh, as we see it in chapters four and six. And see, see if, you, if you can buy this. Because I'm not totally sure if I'm just imposing on this or whether we're actually supposed to see this and kind of look at it this way. So let's take a look at Cain. And you know, what, what's going on in his mind? So he, he and his brother are going to offer offerings. They're going to offer offerings to Yahweh. And Cain looks, he's a farmer, so he goes to his farm, he sees his crops, and he goes, this is good. He sees his crops and he goes, this is good enough for Yahweh. This is good enough for an offering to Yahweh. And he takes it to Yahweh. What went wrong? Okay, so he sees his fruit. He says it's good enough for Yahweh. He takes it to Yahweh. And what went wrong? Okay, but just tell me, you know, doesn't that fit? He sees and he goes, this is good enough. So we'll, we'll come back to this. But let's, let's go to chapter six. And here it's a little bit more explicit. This is what I would have done if I were writing the Bible. It is, is have it just be so clear cut. So six, verse two, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. See, we have that repetition of two words that are from chapter three. Uh, it's a little hard to see this in English but that's okay because the pattern is clearly there. They saw that they were good and they took and they ate, okay, right? So that pattern, you're gonna see this pattern, uh, you're gonna see it again in chapter is 10 or 11 with the Tower of Babel. It's really bad, I should know that. It's chapter 11 uh, with the Tower of Babel. Uh, you're gonna see this pattern of sin again. And then you're going to see it again with, for example, with Abraham and Sarah, where Sarah says she took her servant and she gave to her husband who was with her. And Abraham saw that she was good for <clears throat> reproducing children with. And he took and he ate. Yeah, again, not the exact same language, but I mean, just telling the story, it falls so naturally, does it not? Okay, uh, you're, you're going to see this with Solomon. You know, he saw these foreign women and he saw that they were good for, you know, making covenants with the nations, 300 women, and then 700 women for recreation. Uh, what, what is it? Uh, what is he doing with 700 women? Now, this is over a lifetime, so, you know, that makes sense, right? Yeah, it sure does. Uh, but you're going to see this pattern of behavior as well. Uh, you know, that repetition of, you know, seeing that something is good that God said is really bad, uh, seeing that it's, you know, a delight to the eyes, attractive to the eyes, and then going, oh, I would be really smart if I did this move. Okay. You know, this makes sense to me. Uh, 
you know, making covenants with the nations. That makes good sense to me. You know, having sex with my, Hagar, my servant, because that's what women are for. That sounds good to me. I'd be really smart if I did that. It'd be prudent. Uh, and then the, the take and the gave, you'll, you're going to see that pattern all, all over again. So uh, let's, let's, let me ask, answer a couple of questions that comes up very frequently because chapter six of Genesis is highly confusing. Who are the sons of men? Who are the daughters? Who are the sons of God? Who are the daughters of men? So here's the Choose Your Own Adventure Bible by Steve. The term sons of God, I, I think, is clearly used in three very different senses in the Bible. Sons of God, we will see, refers to children of God, people that he has adopted into his family, that he has chosen, that he has adopted, that are faithful to him. So the sons of God could be, the sons of God could be the faithful line of Seth that we saw at the end, the last sentence of chapter four. These began to call in the name of Yahweh. Well, what were they doing before? Well, apparently not calling on the name of Yahweh. Uh, 20 years ago, this is what I would have told you is the right answer. However, the Bible uses sons of God elsewhere, such as Psalm chapter 2, 2 Samuel chapter 7, to refer to the royal line, to kings. Uh, sons of God would be kings, and what is it that kings do? Uh, this does fit the context a little bit. If you look at the end of chapter, of uh, verse 4, 6 verse 4, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Uh, if I could paraphrase that a little bit uh, to, to make sure you're getting the sense of this, and at this point, I'm pretty confident that I have the general sense. These are mighty warriors, uh, as in warrior kings who go out raping and pillaging and taking what they want by brute force. Yes, they gain such a reputation, they gain renown for brutal behavior, okay? This is the Mongol invasion, the Hun invasion, or you can may as well say the Roman invasion, uh, Babylon, Assyria, America, whatever, whatever uh, empire you want to put in there where people simply take what they want. And so what are they doing? If these sons of God are kings, uh, they're looking at women and just going, what are women good for? Well, they're good for chattel. Or if you prefer the word cattle, you can put that as well. And you just accumulate women like they're cattle. Because you just take what you want. Because you're a mighty warrior. You're a king. You're a, well, yeah. All right. Uh, and so their children, the the word Nephilim, interestingly, the Septuagint, the old Greek translation of the Law and the Prophets, has the word giants here. You know, giants like big people or giants like, you know, men of renown. You know, they were giants in their time. I don't know. Because uh, Nephilim, I would be really tempted to translate it falling, but I don't know if I have much support for that among commentators. Oh, well. Uh, Choose your own adventure. These are the faithful line of Seth. These are the, the kings who become, you know, nothing more than people who rape and pillage. Uh, or sons of God also refers in Job chapter one quite clearly to God's divine counsel, what I would call spiritual beings or divine beings. And you could actually translate the word fairly accurately, sons of God. Uh, the phrase sons of generally means something of that category. So a son of a prophet would be a prophet. A son of the Pharisees would be a Pharisee, okay? That, that would be what uh, such a person is. They would be a divine being. Uh, so Job chapter one, uh, I'm blanking one of the Psalms, but anyway, uh, it talks about the sons of God and God's council chamber, and I'm told this very clearly means divine beings, but in Job chapter one, it's very clearly divine beings, what you would probably call angels, uh, but the more broad category, you know, angels, cherubim, seraphim, uh, if there's any other kinds of supernatural beings, I shouldn't use the word supernatural. Uh, any other kind of divine beings or spiritual beings, uh, they would be in the category of divine beings or spiritual beings. 
Okay, good stuff. Yeah. So choose your own adventure, uh, whichever of those you like. Uh, what you'll notice, though, is with each of these things, we, we've got a broken, broken relationship between humans and God broken relationship between man and wife, broken relationship between uh, brother and brother. And now we've got a broken relationship between sons of God and daughters of men. And depending on what you take sons of God to be, the faithful line of Seth intermarrying with non-Yahweh worshipers or kings just abusing their God-given authority and taking whatever women and whatever they want, uh, broken relationship as far as government goes. Uh, again, it seems to meet the context at least a little bit. Or we actually have in the spiritual realm, uh, demonic activity and uh, kind of like what you have in the Greek mythologies where the gods have sexual relations and pr produce children with uh, with with human women, yeah. Uh, where did those stories come from? Did, did they actually come from the real history of Genesis chapter six? Deno, Deno, uh, choose your own adventure. I am fine with any of those, any of those. Uh, they they all make sense to me. So choose your own adventure, as long as the the Bible actually supports what you're saying. You're not just making stuff up and imposing on. Uh, so again, we have this pattern of seeing with the eyes, saying something is good, finding something attractive, taking and eating it, saying something is prudent or wise to do, uh, and, and following through that. Uh, isn't that what we see with Cain? Now, what, what happened with Cain? What was it that led him to say that this was good, that the fruit that he was offering to God was good, a good offering? So pay attention, pay attention to the, because the, the writing is, I, it looks very intentional to me, because note the pattern. It's Cain, Abel, Abel, Cain, Cain, Abel, Abel, Cain, Cain. And then it goes, Cain, Cain, Abel, Cain, Abel, Cain, and there is no more Abel. So, uh, but you have that clear pattern of, you know, one, two, two, one, one, two, two, one, one. Yeah, uh, you have that clear pattern. So pay attention to this juxtaposing of Cain and Abel. They're set side by side. That's what the word juxtapose means, set by side by side. So Cain is a worker of the ground. He's agrarian. And then... Abel is a keeper of flocks and livestock and whatnot. Uh, and so he is uh, pastoral. Yeah, I think that's the word, agrarian and pastoral. So we got that. Is there, is there anything wrong with Cain being a farmer? I, I yeah, you know, you can read into this. I, I don't think it's there. But then we have this clear contrast with look what Abel, look what Cain brought and look what Abel brought in three verses three and four. And here we seem to have a pretty clear contrast as in Abel brought the firstborn of his flock. Does it say that Cain brought the best, you know, the first of his, his first fruits? Does it say he brought the best? Abel brought both the firstborn and he brought the best. He brought the fat because fat is, fat is just so good for you. As long as you don't consume it in huge quantities, uh, but it just makes food just pop and it satisfies, right? And with Cain, it's just, he brought fruit of the ground. So uh, here's your choose your own adventure again. Uh, what's the problem that, you know, the, the difference, because we see that clear difference. The problem could have been Abel brought a sacrificial animal. We do see that sacrificial animals are important later on. Uh, was that the problem? Maybe. Uh, the one commentary Terry I read said, nope, that's just not justified by the scripture. But you can see this happen where God says, this is what I want from you. And we go, give you this instead. You know, right? Do we do that? The other alternative is 
uh, you know, he wasn't giving the best. He wasn't giving his first fruit. He wasn't giving the best fruit. Uh, it's possible even to read fruit of the ground as in he, he found this fruit on the ground. The fruit had fallen. And, you know, like my dad, you know, you can't let anything go to waste. Uh, but do you give that to God? And so he, he didn't take the best or he took fruit that had fallen on the ground, which if I see the fruit fall on the ground, then I'm like, ooh, this fruit is ripe. I'm going to go eat it. But if I don't see it, I'm like, it has worms. So I'll give it to God. Makes sense to me. Uh, the third alternative is if you read back into the story, Cain's attitude, that he simply went with the wrong attitude. Uh, we see that he's angry. He sees his brother as competition. Uh, and, and he wants to be, you know, if, if, you can't, if you can't beat him, kill him, I guess. Uh, so any of those that you want to take is, is good enough for me. So, but, the, but again, the basic pattern that we see in our lives is our eyes lead us astray. We call something good that God has not called good. We say, we take things that are a delight to the eyes and we assume, oh, it must be good for us. It must be true and because it looks so good and we are deceived. We think that we're being smart. We think we're being prudent. We think we're being wise. And so we take and we eat, and then we give some to our spouse to lead them astray as well, right? And so you're going to see this pattern repeated. The other pattern, I'm just going to be very brief, sin, judgment, grace with Adam and Eve. He brings judgment upon them, which we discussed last week. Not going to go into detail with the judgment. And then he gives grace. He, you know, they, it's so funny. They, they take fig leaves and they dress almost like a tree. It's like, you can't see me. I'm a tree. And God takes them and clothes them with the, with the pelt of an animal. Okay. Just like he's going to be clothing us with the righteousness of Christ uh, through his death and resurrection. So also he's going to be clothing us with, with Cain. We're going to see that same thing. God brings his judgment upon Cain's sin, and then he gives him grace. He puts a mark upon him and saying, don't kill him. How much better the mark that we have upon us? In the law of Moses, the mark is the mark of circumcision to say you're part of God's covenant, to be a blessing to the nations. For us, it's the mark of baptism, the mark of faith in Jesus Christ, that we are marked as children of God by our faith in Jesus, by our baptism, by our participation in the Lord's Supper. Good stuff. Then chapter six, we have the rebellion of human beings. Again, whatever these sons of God, whoever they are, and whatever it is that they did, they rebelled against God. They, they made the world they made the land unlivable. And here we go back to Genesis chapter one, verse two. We go back to the beginning of the story where the land is covered in water. It is chaotic. It's unlivable. It's unordered. It is not fit for human habitation anymore. And so God then brings his judgment and says, I'm going to cover it back up with water. We're going to go back to Genesis one, verse two. We're going to go back to the start of the story which is not, I'm going to start over with a whole, you know, I'm not going to get rid of the old land. Uh, I'm just going to make it back to Genesis 1 verse 2, which is the start of the story. I'm going to cover it with water and we're going to have no more animals, no more humans. We're going to make it unfit for human habitation because they've made it unfit for human habitation. But then God shows his grace by saving one man and one woman and their children, and he starts all over. We're going to see this pattern repeated in the next time. Uh, so we've got Adam and Eve as the start of the first creation, N Noah and his wife, who doesn't get a name, unfortunately, uh, with a start over, a restart of the new creation. And then who can you name that comes after chapter 11, uh, who is the new start of a renewed creation as well. Uh, not with a flood, but just starting over with one man and one woman uh, with the story of Israel. And then, and then, drum roll please. Okay, what do we have in Jesus? One man and his bride, the church, 
starting a renewed creation again to bring God's kingdom, to bring land and sky in harmony once again with each other, to make the world a fit place for human beings to live and to dwell and to rule and to be God's priests and kings upon the earth, to serve all in our vocation in harmony with each other, all brought about through the restoration that is ours in Christ Jesus, our Lord, through his death and resurrection, right? Good stuff. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the seeing the pattern of rebellion, that we continue to repeat that in our own lives. We ask that you would help us to embrace your judgment on that sin uh, so that we could stop doing it. And more importantly, do so through the grace that you give to us in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now the Lord bless you. No, no, it's wrong line. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. No, I'm still doing it wrong. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen.